Welcome to The Buck Stops here, the official audio show of NotInHallOfFame.com, and I'm your host, Kirk Buckner, The Buck. I'm the guy who owns and operates NotInHallOfFame.com, and of course, the sister sites, the Fictitious Athlete Hall of Fame, the Fictitious Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and a few other fun projects that are coming up. It's Season 1, Episode 50, Episode 50 of our weekly Hall of Fame show, and Evan Nolan and I, we've uh, always got something to talk about that's Hall of Fame related. Uh, We've had a tragic death uh, recently, that of Charlie Pride, who was inducted, or inducted again a a second time with a Lifetime Achievement Award in the Country Music Hall of Fame. He passed away at 88, so we take a look at, a second look at his career, because we covered him recently for receiving this honor. We also took a look at the International Boxing Hall of Fame. They announced their class of 2021, and it is a loaded class. Three undefeated boxers. That's probably the first time that's ever happened. I should have checked that out. We also took a look at Major League Baseball's announcement that they are recognizing the statistics of the Negro Leagues that that occurred from 1920 to the mid-50s. And what does that mean? What does that mean for some fringe people for the Hall of Fame? Not that much, but we did look at a couple players in particular, and Evan brought a pretty good point about this very sudden announcement and where it may have came from. We also took a look at Omar Vizquel, who's gotten himself in a little bit of hot water. He's on the ballot for the Baseball Hall of Fame. Does this affect him? It could. It couldn't. Would it have mattered anyway? All that and more. Let's bring in Evan. Evan, you realize we've made it to episode 50. Nobody's canceled us. The beige mistress hasn't come for us. Thank God I'm not Hungarian. <laughs> <laughs> That's a sentence you I probably have never though, said. When we, get, when we get to the end of this year, uh, I may have to have some unicum uh, in her honor. I have, have, have I told you about unicum before? No. So unicum, uh, have you ever been to Hungary before? I can honestly say I have not. Well, Hungary is a wonderful place. I've only really been to Budapest and on the train ride from from uh, Serbia into Budapest. Um, but it, it, I spent three days in uh, Hungary, uh, in Budapest, and it was it's a lovely place. It's, I highly recommend going there. It's one of the more interesting cities in Europe. But they have this national drink, and I, I may have told you before, like if there's a competition for worst national drinks, Unicum has to be. A top like a sixty four bracket thing. It's the number one seed. I don't know if it's if it or Palinkovac, which is Serbia's, or Malort, which is uh, I don't know if it's actually Sweden's. But here in Chicago, we pretend it's Sweden's national drink, and it's all over the place, and it's awful. But Unicum is their national drink, and it comes in a bottle that looks like a cartoon bomb with a <laughs> plus sign on it. It is, you know, that old sign from uh, from. Uh, uh, who, who sang Love Potion Number 9? I can't remember. But it smells like turpentine and looks like India ink. That's basically the description of Uniku. Jesus. So, and if you're ever over there, now you're Canadian, so it may not be the same. Or they may just presume you're American. Uh, but when I was over there, I was at a bar, and they're like, are you an American? And I said, yeah. And they're like, you have to drink this. And I had like three shots of Uniku bought for me in the space of two hours. And it was... Um, it was uh, a test of intestinal fortitude not to retch. But, I, <laughs> but I, of course, I had to buy a bottle when I left because you have to you have to show other people. That's the difference between guys and girls. Girls have something gross. They're like, say, no, don't have that. Guys have something gross. They're like, here, you got to try this. So I've gone home so other people can try. But I think at the end of the year, with all the beige mistresses done this year to protect myself, since I've made it through, I probably need to do a shot of it. I, I think that should be maybe her name. <laughs> Unicum? Ooh, no, I, oh man, maybe that's like an anagram or something. Like this is the didn't they figure out the Zodiac killers thing this week? Yeah, something like that. Maybe we have, I'll wait for the movie. Maybe we have to maybe we have to be, drink some Unicum and figure out exactly what they mean. So, oh, oh anyway. well, it'd be a nice sort of welcome change from the beer and rum that I have here. I miss Jack Daniels. It's just too damn expensive here for me to buy on a regular basis. Uh, should should we get to a comments? Which I think might be a nice way to start. Oh, sure. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, this, that's new. Let's do that. Yeah, so it uh, sort of ties in with last week, which was our shortest show. This m- might rival it. 
But I, I think it's sort of a, a good tie-in yeah. with uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame sort of gearing into into full gear. So it's uh, from Rich, Rich Vichy, who's uh, commented a couple times before. So as a lifelong Phillies fan, Dick Allen should have been in the Hall of Fame decades ago, especially a few years ago when he and Tony Oliva missed out by one vote. I was happy to see his number get retired by the Phillies and get honored by the city of Philadelphia. Well, the whole city honored him? That's awesome. I didn't know that. Uh, the Hall of Fame should be ashamed for postponing this year's senior election. Agreed. Until next year when they could have easily held the meeting this year. Absolutely. And what really sucks is it sure puts him in the Hall of Fame next year because it will look bad even if he doesn't make it, even though it already looks bad. And then he mentions a few other people who are getting older. Uh, so Oliva and Jim Cotter are 82. Uh, Tommy John is 77. Maury Wills is 88. And Louis Tiant is 80. I don't think Maury Wills really has a chance in hell, but the other ones, there are such strong cases for all of them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, here's the point. I think I think if there's one thing we've learned over the last little time here, it's that none of these Halls of Fames really have any idea what to do about senior candidates. No. No, none, none of like, them do. And, that, and I'm including the Rock Hall in this. Like, the Rock Hall doesn't even have a senior category, and they should. I don't think hockey even thinks about it. Now, granted, because of, like, what we talked about before, because they got such an early start on this, there's not a whole lot of senior candidates that really stick out in the mind in the minds of people. Uh, basketball does have their senior committees, uh, com- two, I believe, because I know they've got their African American Pioneer Committee, so they've got that. Uh, right. Baseball, and it goes back to something you've been saying all all you know, for for years. Actually, since we started this, since you and I started talking. It's just got its own head up its ass, especially with writers for that. It's never – I don't know if it's ever going to change. Seeing some younger blood and certainly does. But the fact that, again, and Vinny Laspinuso, our friend, has been so adamant about this. Like how hard is it to put a Zoom together? It's not. It's not hard. If my dad can figure out Zoom, all of you writers can. Yeah. Yeah, well, Vinny also had some other things to say to. Uh, <laughs> I was cleaning it up, <laughs> but, but but he he always does. But uh, yeah, uh, because it looks it looks very much, I think, like the baseball writers are not going to elect anybody this year, from what we have seen. It's uh, it's trending that way, isn't it? I I thought this could be Kurt Schilling's year, but then Kurt's been, well, he's sort of like back to being Kurt Schilling. Yeah. I mean, I think the comment that John Heyman meant, because one of the, there was a guy who did vote for Schilling this year, who voted before, and uh, Heyman, it basically came down to the fact that he just thinks Schilling's a jerk, which, granted, yes, but again, Ty Cobb is a bigger jerk than Kurt Schilling ever was. Kennesaw Mountain Landis is a much bigger jerk than he ever was. Mm-hmm. Um, and those guys in the Hall of Fame. So... The idea that, you know, it's good for him that he's standing up for what's right, but at the same time, Kurt then pointed out that these are the same guys who came through the defense of, uh, what's his name from Philly, who, uh, Bill Conlon, right, who was on the, uh, yep. used to be on the sports reporters all the time and got into the hall and then was accused of, and, and what we, from what we could tell, pretty accurately accused of pedophilia. And they're all defending him. And yet, because, again, Schilling has a lot of reasons that people may not like him. Um, but that that was okay. But him being outspoken and whatever, that's what Schilling thinks of it. That's politics. Um, I can't say he's entirely wrong. Uh, so, I mean, but, yeah, I don't think they elect anybody at all, and which is a double problem. Because what they could have done is if they weren't going to elect anybody at all, have a seniors committee meet, figure that out, and then just have senior guys go in. But they also, like, would anyone be upset if they didn't elect anybody from the normal group but elected Dick Allen and, and Tony Oliva? Yeah, but I guess what they're thinking also is they don't have to because there's going to be a class anyway. 
Right. I know. We, you and I were on opposite sides of this. I said I well, didn't think they'd elect any, they'd possibly didn't elect anyone. Then you, and you thought it was yeah. your time to elect Schilling, and we're both right. Like, that's an argument we're both right. It just depended on which way they fell on this. We talked about this a couple It lo- weeks looks now. like, yeah, um, Linda, it looks like uh, your prognostication was more accurate than mine, which is why you're always ahead of me in beer bets. I'm, I'm losing, though. I just, uh, I have to say, watching this, um, this game between the Chargers and uh, the Raiders, which is coming to its nadir here, uh, there are at least three better quarterbacks in, on this field tonight than, uh, than are on the Patriots roster. So you're going to win that one with the Bills. And the Bills are a much better team than I anticipated they'd be. So. Well, there's also the Miami also. But, yeah. But yeah, the- Miami. I don't, I don't. I'm not that worried about Miami, but uh, the Bills are the Bills are the only team I think that can stop Kansas City from going to the Super Bowl. And I didn't think I was going to be saying that. I don't think I don't think Pittsburgh's that good. I've been saying that for weeks. They're too whiny. That team is much too whiny. So, so I, I missed my perfect way to do a segue because we were talking about sort of like a uh, double class. Mm-hmm. Here, here we will have a double class for the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah. Because they put yeah, push back their 2020 class, and they're adding 2021. Uh, so that's going to be on the same day. So that's going to be a long, long-ass day, but probably a lot of fun. Did you take a look at this 2021 group? Yeah, well, the 2020 group, just so we know, is already – well, go ahead. Go, go ahead do yours. Do the new guys. We'll go back and get the other ones. Okay, yeah, so I'll just go quickly in, in alphabetical order, and I'll go in a little bit if there's more to sort of say about them. Uh, for, I guess this will be the first time, well, it is the first time, father-daughter, Layla Ali joins her dad. Uh, Layla never lost. Uh, I don't want to say that she's overrated, but she really didn't have anyone to fight. She did beat Christy Martin, who was somebody who I remember watching uh, fight too, because she was... Kind of the first big, not biggish name, which was never that big, but Leila Ali did headline the first ever women's boxing pay per view. So that you know that's something. And like she did lose on the Max Singer, so <laughs> she's got that. Could she sing? I, I did. I, that's not my show. She wasn't, she wasn't bad. She wasn't bad. I have to say, she was one of the. She wasn't great, but she wasn't. She wasn't as bad as. Uh, some people have been that shot. So that, the final, the finale was yesterday. I'm sure you were uh, very upset you missed it. No, yeah, broke me. But then again, I'm not going to get all high and mighty because I just got so super excited because now I just got Hulu and I just realized that the entire series of Flavor of Love is up. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing is, to have it, uh, it, it's also in a category for strong black leads. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Or no, no, sorry, that's black stories. Which okay, I, I um, either way, it's I don't know how. Yeah, I, I, you know what? I'll just sort of like end it at that. End it with that. <laughs> that's that's probably a safer place to be. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, talking about uh, uh, someone who they thought was on the Mass Singer. If that was flavor play, but anyway, keep, keep going. Uh, so Freddie Brown, legendary cut man. Dr. Margaret Goodman, this, uh, she's an interesting uh, uh, person for this. Uh, first uh, female ringside physician and a noted neurologist. Why would they need a mer- neurologist or boxer? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe Layla's dad might have had some, had, uh, might have had some comments on that. Ooh. Yeah, maybe I should, have, I should think about editing that out. Eh, I won't. Yeah, maybe. But, hey, but why start now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, George Kimball, in the Observer category, uh, writer for the Boston Herald, uh, wrote a book, Four Kings, Leonard Hagler, Hearns, and Duran, The Last Great Era of Boxing. I don't know that that's necessarily yeah, true, but that was quite yeah, an era. I, 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 used to get, um, I used to get the Herald, my dad, I grew up with some very Republican parents, and we got the Herald in the house, and... Uh, and uh, I do have to say, Kimball was, was a very good writer, enough that he made me care about something that I just don't care about with your thoughts. So. Nice. Well, speaking of making somebody, here's the opposite. Vladimir Klitschko. 
Mm. Boxing champion, 23 defenses in the heavyweight division, and hardly anyone in the United States gave a crap. Yeah. I, I hate to say it, but that's essentially what it was. Uh, Ivan Drago pr- was the exact opposite. Hey, we've got this big, powerful Russian. Eh, it didn't quite translate into the actual <laughs> pay-per-view buys. Most of his fights were in Europe. Uh, but mm. I didn't realize this un- until I sort of like wrote about it. So he, ha- he was a champion in the heavyweight division for 4,382 days. Longer than anyone. That's incredible. So that's arguably wow. in that in that realm of talking about some of the of one of the best heavyweight boxers of all time, and all in an era where heavyweight boxing just went to shit. Just yeah, it's it's crazy just how how little somebody with this amount of skill. This amount of talent and this amount of wins just didn't translate. Although, you know who we married? Someone really little, if I remember correctly. Yeah, the cheerleader from uh, Heroes and uh, the lead in Nashville. Hayden Penitair? Yes, thank you. No. I just remember she was, I've seen pictures, and it was a little blonde American, but I can't remember who it was. So. Got to imagine, like, when those two are having sex, it's sort of like a bear mauling a squirrel. I won't edit that Thank out you. either. I won't edit it out. <laughs> no, I, 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 I probably won't. Uh, Jay, moving on. Jay Larkin, uh, television boxing entertainment executive, produced Showtime Championship Boxing and Showbox. So that's a pretty big deal. Uh, the, yeah. re- the real main event, Floyd Mayweather Jr., 50 and 0. I guess he could possibly lose to. Is it Logan? No, he's got Jake Paul. Or is it Logan Paul? Jake Paul, yeah. Yeah, Jake Paul next. Uh, oh, I also think I saw that Jake Paul was offering money to, um, to the Irish guy, right? I think it was Conor like, McGregor. Like, Conor McGregor. Yeah. Floyd Mayweather is. I, I don't know that he's the most intelligent individual on the planet. He's, but once he's in those four, those th- that ring, he is the smartest boxer that I've ever seen. Mm. The way he, he, even when he looks like he's losing, he's not. He, you're doing exactly what he that, what, that he that he wants you to do. It, it is the most brilliant thing of just to watch defensive boxing from Floyd Mayweather. Uh, defeated. Look at these guys. He beat uh, Pacquiao, Cotto, Mosley. De La Hoya, Gotti, and Connor. It is crazy what this man has accomplished. And every time he'll hype you up to watch his fight with his mouth, and then every time you watch it, it's this defensive exhibition that usually gets people bored. Mm-hmm. But then he wins. But you know, he's never lost. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Jackie McCoy, a longtime trainer and manager. Uh, Davey Moore. Died uh, right after his uh, after his last loss. Apparently, Bob Dylan wrote a song about it. Jackie Tana, Jackie Tanawanda, boxer from the seventies. Uh, actually, she was someone who was considered. She might be considered if the if the UFC ever does sort of like a like an older older pioneer division. She'd definitely be someone to consider because she was doing mixed martial arts back in the seventies. Interesting. Yeah, uh, Maria Trim- uh, Trimiar. I apologize if I'm s- pronouncing that incorrect. Incorrectly, you actually fought Tonawanda, 14 and 4 record, recognized as a lightweight champion when they didn't really have sanctioning bodies. And Andre Ward, another guy who never lost a fight. So we have three undefeated people on this 32 and 0, super middleweight, light heavyweight. Imagine that you're undefeated, 32 and 0. Two-time champion, gold medalist, and you're at best the number four person on this in terms of recognition yeah. behind Ali, uh, Mayweather, and Klitschko. And and what you said was double class. And the previous class has uh, Bernard Hopkins, Juan Manuel Marquez, and Shane Mosley. Yeah, and Christy so, Martin, who I, I just mentioned. And Christy Martin, right? Yes, and Christy Martin. So I mean, that's a lot of firepower, like for that whole group. Kind of crazy. 
It, no, it absolutely is. I might want to take a trip out to upstate New York to watch that, to uh, go partake in Anastoda, something like that. Canastota, New York. I'm just assuming that's upstate. It just seems like something that yeah, would be upstate. Is. I'm pretty sure it's on I-90. Um, yeah, I-90 runs right through it. Because I've seen signs in the Boxing Hall of Fame driving from Boston to Chicago before. So, yeah, I get the Basketball Hall of Fame, the Boxing Hall of Fame, and the Baseball Hall of Fame. And Canton's not that far from I-90. So, lots of stuff there. So, congratulations to this class. It, I love it. I... I, I can't – it's going to be hard to sort of like duplicate that going forward. I don't know that there's that many giant names coming up in the world of boxing, especially for – considering boxing just doesn't have the cachet it does. Or, but then who knows? Maybe 20 years from now we'll be talking about the class that includes the Paul brothers. God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to get gonna get to the fridge in the new bowl. <laughs> oh, God, celebrity box. That would be, okay, because next year, I'm, I'm going to segue right out of this, but that's okay. So I told yep. you that we're going to do a third show, and you're going to be on this periodically. I think I'm just going to have rotating guests on this, and it's going to be just okay. taking a look at shit that was on national television. You and I okay, reviewing... Yeah, I've, already, I've already told you there's one thing that yeah. when you do it, I have to be on for. Yes, so but yes. I think you and I looking at a celebrity boxing... <laughs> might be really fun. Uh, what was there a card? A Tanya Harding against somebody. Uh, didn't she fight? I think she fought somebody who used to sleep with Bill Clinton or something. I don't remember who. Monica, not Monica. Where Tanya Harding fought. Um, I, I know. Fight, I, I know. Uh, there's one where China, like the 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 now deceased pro wrestler, fought Joey Buttafuoco. Yeah, I remember that. I think Danny Bonaducci beat the crap out of one of the Brady kids. Yeah, was it Christopher Knight? I think so. She fought, yeah, Tanya Harding fought Paula Jones. Okay, and she was one of the mistresses of Clinton, right? I believe so, yes. Oh, you know what's bad when I type in celebrity boxing and then the first word that comes up afterwards is screech. <laughs> yeah, Danny Bonaduce fought Donny Osmond. What the hell? I missed that one. Oh, and and no, and um, and he fought uh, uh, Barry Williams, and Todd Bridges fought Vanilla Ice. And then they both were in a movie together. Yeah. So uh, uh, that's Dustin my boy. Diamond and Ron Palillo Manupo against uh, the fridge of Joey Buttafuoco against China. Oh my and God. originally, originally Weird Al was supposed to fight China, but he didn't see a positive career move. <laughs> and then, well, I, mean, I, I think it was. I, I, I guarantee you, if he would have done that, there's no way he would have later in, in his early 50s had his first ever number one album. In his last album, he said he's ever going to make. Oh, really? Yeah, because he says that the album format doesn't make sense for him. Because right, by the, he yeah, comes up point. with something, and by the time the album comes out, it's like 15 months later. That and it's, it's passed by, so he's going to do individual stuff. Plus, I think I told you, that was his 13th album, and it completed his first record deal. They signed him to a 13-album deal, and it took him from 1981 until 2018, to get done with his record deal. That might, so, that might have been one of their most profitable signings, too. Probably. Yeah, I mean, he's, uh, his star has, like, completely risen in his 50s, which doesn't happen with many artists and certainly not parody artists. To the fact that, uh, the matter, honestly, he's probably, at this point, a serious contender for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He will be when I do the revisions for next year. He's going to be on that. I, that's I, I've been called out on it before because he's not part of my uh, the core list for the Not Hall Not Hall Rock list uh, for those to consider. I never included him. I've been asked this literally from I don't want to say literally from day one. That's another poor use of the word literally, but 
real, from the from the beginning, and uh, that's going to be rectified. It's probably going to be at a pretty high rank at that. And I'll even put in the cow. I'll even put it in the content. I I screwed up. So be it. Yeah, my kids every night uh, they get three songs on a on like our phones before they go to bed. I used to sing to them, and then my wife like started showing them stuff on the phones. And now we don't sing to them anymore. They do stuff on the phones. But basically, both of them at this point want perform this way by him. And either my daughter likes like a surgeon, and my son likes um, fat. <laughs> by, by them so usually it perform this way and then one of those and then something else before we go to bed and then my daughter usually picks something from from the sound of music it's a very odd combination of things so I, I got well, I, I can't judge I when, when I first got my first iPod it, it, everything there I know one time I'm just like walking around it actually went from Wu-Tang to Polka that literally happened <laughs> I love it all I I spent a lot of time trying to remember all the words to hardware store. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> so. so we okay. have. Uh, oh, let's see. Let's I, see. Hold on. All right. Just for a second. I'm going to challenge myself. See how far I can get. All right. They got Allen Ritchie, yeah. Gerbil Peters, Toilet Seats, Electric Keys, Traction, Compacted Juices, Tractors, Shower Rods, Water Meetings, Walking Talkers, Couple Wires, Safety Goggles, Rated Toes, BB Pellets, Rubber uh, BB Pellets, Rubber Mallets, Fancy Dehumidifiers, Picture Hangers, Paper Cutters, Waffle Irons, Window Shutters, Paint Movers, Plastic Louvers. Uh, masking tape and oh no I lost it anyway I, it's been too long I need to get back I need to get back my iPod it still works and just listen to that over and over again <laughs> uh, iPod memories takes you back yeah yeah so, anyway so we've got a, a country music legend who passed away we, we, I guess there's not a whole lot new that we can say because we talked about Charlie Pride a few weeks ago in the announcement yeah. that he was going to be the Receiving that was at the Lifetime Achievement Award with the Country Music Hall of yeah, Fame. Yeah, it, 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 it's called the Willie Nelson Award. Oh, Willie yeah, Nelson Award, thank you. Only four people have ever gotten it, and he it was him, Dolly Parton, I think George Jones, and Charlie Pride. So yeah, so we we went over his career, just the uniqueness of it. Passed away from COVID. They're not sure really where he got it. It's possible he might have got it at the ceremony because they did have one. And while precautions were in place, you know, you're traveling from A to B, things happen. We, again, I, I don't want to, like, point fingers at the Hulk. We don't know. They don't we know. We don't know, right. He, and also, when you're 88 years old, you know. If you're 88 year old and get a Lifetime Achievement Award, is it worth the risk anyway? <laughs> Well, it's like it's like I'm never going to jump out of a plane. But if I'm 95, what have I got to lose? So, I, I, either way, it, it's sort of like I guess the opposite of what sort of might be happening with Dick Allen. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, and I think you know he died doing what he loved. I don't know if there's anything yeah. more to say about Charlie Pride. I was reading a lot more articles about some of the other things that he went through. The one thing I, I, I didn't know, I think I read this in Variety, that the record company initially didn't want to put his face on the cover. Oh, because they were worried that it wouldn't sell. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I hate to say it, maybe there's something to it. I, I told you this uh, off air before. I'm going to sanitize this. Uh, for for the for for this version, and they're they're probably onto something. Uh, my grandfather uh, Qu- uh, from Quebec, who was a big, just loved country music. Uh, never knew my name though. He, like he's very French, and Kirk is not a French name, so he'd see me like, oh, hello. Uh. <laughs> hey, that's yeah. He'd just sort of smile there, and, and his English was horrible, and my French was terrible, and. I didn't know my name anyway, so I didn't really make much of an effort. But, you know, uh, he loved his country music uh, when he would visit and, st- and sometimes they would stay with us for a bit. They'd be watching Hee Haw. Mm. And, uh, but not if Charlie Pride was on the, on the TV, and we know why. For one reason yeah. and one reason only. I never, I never understood it at all, but... 
nevertheless, if my grandpa felt that way, guaranteed there were a lot of others who felt the same way that he did. It sort of made me think that someone like Charlie Pride, I don't know that he necessarily got a lot of black people into country music, probably, probably not, realistically, but he did show them that it was possible. I would like to think that he opened up a lot of people's eyes who wouldn't necessarily be around black people in their life, depending on where they're growing up, yeah. to just sort of like think about it a second way. I, I, I would hope. I'm sure, actually, I'm sure he did. Yeah, I mean, even my mom, uh, who grew up in mostly rural Illinois, uh, said the first time she'd ever seen a black person was when she went to college. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a large part, parts of the world where people just don't have any exposure to people who don't look like them. Although that's a lot less of that now right. than there used to be. Um, I, was, I was doing a Sporkle quiz today. I don't know if you know what Sporkle is. The quiz. Oh, God, yes. Um, yes. So I was doing a Sporkle quiz today, and one of the, the questions was uh, the countries where most immigrants came to for each state at different points of time, and I got all of them except for 2013 in South Dakota was Ethiopia. I yeah. hadn't thought of a whole bunch of Ethiopians being in South Dakota, but if there are that many Ethiopians in South Dakota, then even that, even the most rural places in the country are, are, uh, are becoming less really white and more, more of a mixture. Right. Uh, right. And, and that's where the world is, is going to. And, you know, R.A.P. Charlie Pride, I spent a bit of time listening to his music uh, this week. I, again, I'm not a country music connoisseur. I do love live country, but I don't download it and listen to it often, but I was enjoying a bit of a set list that Apple put together. So I, yeah. you know, our R.A.P., what more can we really say about him? Yeah, I mean, we already went through it. It was uh, it was really sad when it happened, and if that's why he died, that's also. For, I mean, we know how he died, but if if he caught it there, that's also going to make a lot of people feel pretty bad about the whole situation. So, uh, and you know, like uh, I, I don't want to say as it should, but you know. Obviously, if it was there, then then enough precautions weren't taken taken place, or right. who knows? I mean, I I, I don't want again. I, let's not. Po- there's no point in pointing fingers because we don't know. Uh, so we'll just sort of like celebrate his life and what a great life it was. Yeah. Speaking of great lives, we also lost this week. Actually, today, mm-hmm. Jeremy Bullock passed away. Also better known to us as Boba Fett from Star Wars, and a couple, and also a couple of. Uh, of the Empire uh, officers along the way in other movies. But yeah, Boba Fett passed away, another original member of the Star Wars cast. In the Sarlacc pit? He was not the pit of Sarlacc, unfortunately. Okay. Although I hope that's another, I hope that's where he ends up being in tune. It seems appropriate. <laughs> that was, I think, the worst end. I, I, I can... I hate that more, actually... Then uh, greet then Han shooting first. Or sorry, Greedo shooting first. <laughs> yeah, well, Greedo shooting first is a complete change of the narrative of the characters when they edited that up or edited it that way. I mean, we could go on and on about that, but how many other podcasts have beaten us to it? <laughs> a lot. Yeah, probably a lot. We're. We just, you know, we just started realized that we were in our forties and needed a podcast. So there have been many white men in their forties before. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of leave one one thought though. I was at uh, back in Toronto. Uh, Pauline and I, my lovely wife, we would do. We put countries in a hat, and every once a month, our date night, whatever country comes out, that would be the, t- the type of food we would go to. My wife and I did something very similar. So, oh, okay. yeah, it's, a, no, it's an awesome thing to do when you're in a great city to do that, like Toronto. And I guess you could do that in Boston. I'm sure you can in Chicago. So we picked uh, oh, yeah. Brazil <laughs> out, and we went to this fancy Brazilian steakhouse, and we dressed up for it, and a lot of people did. And I'm looking across, and there was this one guy who said Han, and his T-shirt was Han shot first. Like, okay, I, I agree with you, but 
maybe this isn't the place to wear that in a nice little <laughs> Brazilian steakhouse on a Saturday night there, guy? I don't know. <laughs> I've got a lot of geeky t-shirts myself, but uh, this is now kind of my job. So that's okay. Yeah. True. But yeah, I know. That, that's a really great thing to do. Um, we did it in Boston. We did it when we lived in D.C. Uh, we could probably even do it out here mostly in the suburbs. We'd have to travel a little bit further far here in Chicago. Downtown, easily. But out in the suburbs, we'd have, probably have to travel a little bit further. Um, but we have kids now who don't eat anything. So mm. um, unless it's some form of noodle, they're not going to consume it. <laughs> That well, was the most. It was. We had so much fun doing that. Yeah. What's the What's the best random ethnic food that you hadn't tried before that you had? Uh, the type of food or the restaurant? Either one. Honduras, and I don't remember the food. It was like like some kind of empanada or something like that. Because we were living in this one area where there was just like random Latin American restaurants. So it's not really like a Latin, but it wasn't really part of a Latin American stretch. Just happened to be all there. So that, but like the, the coolest food I ever had, and I wish I would have asked what it was. Actually, it wasn't a food. It was a sauce at a Peruvian restaurant. This green, not so hot sauce, but it was great with fries. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so for us, we went to the Helmond in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, uh, which is actually owned by Muhammad Karzai's brother, hmm. uh, but it's an Afghan restaurant, and it was so good, and there's, um, I'm trying to find the, I'm looking at the re- recipe right now, but there was a, I'm looking at the, the, the vegetarian, that's my problem, there was a what I'm going to say sounds absolutely gross. I'm going to tell you this ahead of time, but it may be the best meal I've ever eaten. It is a pumpkin gelatin with a lamb meat sauce and yogurt on top of it. And I'm trying to remember the name of it. And it is seriously one of the most delicious things I've ever had in my life. I brought my parents there who were very, very concerned. I told you, Republican parents. <laughs> I'm really concerned about going to an Afghan restaurant owned by Mohammed Karzai's brother. And my dad tried it. We ordered a couple. And my dad tried it. He could not believe it. He actually ordered another. It was that good. So I have to say, not knowing much about Afghan food, that was an absolute experience. So if you ever, ever came Cambridge, Massachusetts, find a Helmont. Abs- absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so, uh, and. How did we not have this all prepped ahead of time? This is like what we always do. Because how did we not? How did we not have Afghan food and Peruvian green sauce ready to talk about? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's going to be an episode of like Cutthroat Kitchen. You have to put those two things together. <laughs> Something. Who, who else passed away? Uh, yeah, so we didn't, we didn't have that many this week. Uh, we had Jimmy McLean, a Hall of Fame American swimmer, passed away at the age of ninety. Um, McLean is three-time Olympic champion and world record holder. Uh, he won gold medal in, um, in, uh, the 1952 Olympics in, in, um, in Helsinki and he won two in the 48 Olympics in London. Uh, but he passed away at the age of 90 in Ipswich, Massachusetts, uh, where he had lived for the previous 13 years. He passed in his home and didn't say what from. Uh, we also lost a recently elected Hall of Famer, Sue Donahoe, uh, who was elected to the Women's uh, Basketball Hall of Fame earlier this summer, but they didn't have the, um, mm-hmm. yeah, the ceremony, ceremony was postponed, because yeah. of everything here. But Donahoe used to be the director of both the men and women's NCAA basketball. Um, she was, had a brief illness that was not COVID, uh, but she passed away at the age of 61. Oh, too young. So, yeah. So she uh, she uh, was on. She was the graduate assistant at Louisiana Tech when they won their first women's NCAA title in '82. So, and she was on all sorts of other stuff and became one of the most important people and maybe the most important woman in NCAA sports for a while. I would she passed say so. Yeah, I'm sorry. I would say, I would say so. I can't really think of anyone who might. 
really I mean, be at that level. Of players, and you can say whatever with players, but I mean, the only other person who probably approaches her, and she wasn't even as high up as Donahoe, was uh, Pat Summit. Probably it's the only other person you think of in in women's NCAA sports. Yeah, but it would not. She really encompassed just one school. I not Correct. of course everyone knows Pat Summit, of course, but still. Right. Yeah. Um, and we also had, uh, this is more a little more personal for us out here in Chicago, but the youngest son of Muddy Waters passed away. Um, what is going on here? I'm trying to read the thing in it. Like, put a huge act across what I'm trying to read. Uh, but uh, Mojo, uh, Joseph Mojo Morganfield, who was, uh, we, have a, we have a Blues Breakers um, uh show on a Sunday night at like 9 o'clock which I listen to every once in a while and Mojo Morganfield had uh, several things that he had been coming out of the last few months he had a whole album in the work they were kind of releasing the songs one at a time in terms of, uh, for the album to come out uh, and he passed away in his house or actually I guess he made it to the hospital he passed away at only the age of 56 after collapsing in his kitchen um, but I, I mean Chicago has a long history of blues. They say they're the birthplace of the blues. I know that New Orleans and Memphis might have some arguments with that. Um, but there's a lot of blues. There's a lot more blues here than you would think for a city like Chicago. And they have, have, multiple stations have just blues on all the time. And, uh, I mean, Muddy Waters, youngest kid, and, like, he was, he was pretty good. Not because he was Muddy Waters' kid. He was pretty good uh, as, a, as an artist. And it's sad he, always, he was only 52 when he passed. Uh, and finally, um, we did have uh, the, as I said earlier, the, uh, the beige mistress struck again, taking Cal- Kalman Sovari. And there are three accents in there, and I don't know how to. It's K A with an accent, L M A with an accent, N. Second name, S O with an accent, B A with an accent, R I. I don't speak Hungarian, so I'm just going to call him on Safari. Uh, but he was a defender for the Hungarian national soccer team. Uh, he played uh, in two World Cup matches in uh, 62 and one in the 66 World Cup finals. And his father had, was an Olympic wrestler for, uh, for Hungary, but he passed away at the age of uh, 80. Uh, actually, no, I'm 70, 79. His birthday's actually uh, coming up this weekend. He was 79 when he passed away. So there you go. That's everybody uh, to go through on the uh, on the list. And I was looking up something happy for the heck of it just to see if we had any good birthdays today. And uh, the best I could come up with other than maybe the Pope <laughs> is, uh, let's see, we got Eugene Le- uh, Levy. We got Ken Hitchcock, who we thought, I thought might be in like the Hall of Fame this year. We got um, Bob Ojeda. Like, oh, yeah, I remember. I, mean, I know I have a lot of people here. Bob Ojeda, probably most famous for surviving that boat crash that killed um, Tim Cruz and and Steve Olin back in what was that ninety ninety one? The three Indian pitchers who were uh, out drinking and crashed into the dock. One of his baseball cards kicking around here somewhere. Man, I got I got one too. I actually wrote him. I used to write a lot of poetry as a kid. I wrote a poem about that boat crash, believe it or not. So, and of course, Mila Jovovich. We'll, we'll go with that. That's a pretty good one. Sure. So, Mila, Mila Jovovich is 45 today. Do you think, like, the okay. Pope and Mila Jovovich might, like, sort of, like, celebrate their birthday together? That, I'd, I'd pay to see that. Not a lot, but I'd still pay to that for that. Well, a couple other people they could share with. They could bring in Chuck Liddell's birthday today. Hmm. So, like, Pope... Yeah, that would be interesting. And, and Manny Pacquiao. So, so the Pope could say to, to Mila, like, uh, when, they're, when they're celebrating their cake, and says, like, no, the, the final fantasy is within Christ. <laughs> no? I, okay. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that's exactly what, exactly what he would say. And that's a very good RGT accent. I don't even know what the hell I was going with because I don't even know what the Pope is. <laughs> I have no idea where he's from. Yeah, he's, he's, he's Argentine. Oh, yeah. Is he okay? I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's the first Franciscan, which is why, uh, well, 
I don't get into things, but Franciscans are very much about, you know, helping the poor, which is why a lot of the religious right in this country has a problem with it. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah, the, anyway, we, we pretty much established what I know about religion. Really, with that one sent, that one bad joke, I know nothing. All right. Well, here's here's your transition. Right. Speaking of things that are going to upset the religious right, Major League Baseball. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, they also upset a couple people on the far left too, from what we've seen. But that is true. Yeah. Right? Well, there there are two things that happened to baseball this week, and I let's. Let's take a one. Uh, let's take the big one that you were talking about first, and then I'm going to tie it to something else. Sure. So go ahead. Yeah. So the I actually didn't even know this. This hadn't happened yet, and which is like, I'm more surprised at myself because I mean I go I pour through stats all the time, but basically Major League Baseball has announced that they're going to incorporate the Negro League stats as part of their own lore, which. I can't even imagine the people at Baseball Reference once they learn that. Like, they've got to be thrilled and just like, oh, my God, at the same time. Who's going to be working on that? Well, I I feel like they probably already had it separate, and they just have to figure out how to combine them. Because those Baseball Reference guys, I'm pretty sure, probably had all that stuff set just in case anyone came up for the Hall of Fame again. Um, But, yeah, it's that's a big deal. It changes a whole bunch of leaderboards on stuff and everything else. It's an interesting recognition. I know that we had some people, I don't think this one upset the the right as much as some people on the left. Yeah. Of the idea. We saw a couple of places, people saying that baseball has, let's just say a checkered history with racism. Um, As do all sports. Let's to be fair. they, They all do. But, yeah, they all do. Baseball is just more publicized because uh, it was a bigger sport at the time. And baseball has basically elected all of their races. Uh, That's to the true, Hall too. Of fame at this point. Although, although Mark Shot is not there. Um, but, uh, but, I mean, Tom Yockey and Charlie Kaniski and uh, I, I, second time bringing him up, Kennesaw Mountain Landis uh, and people like that are all in that Hall of Fame. Um, but the, the problem they had is that somehow – uh, ma- the Negro Leagues were their own special thing because the uh, Major League Baseball won't let them in. And now this is sort of pandering, saying, all right, finally you're equal to us, when they'd always been equal all along. And that's at least the argument we've been seeing right. from certain corners. Um, it's a tricky situation because, I mean, the guy who's in charge of the Negro Leagues is ecstatic about this decision. Yes. Or the, the, the main Negro League, he's not in charge. He's the main Negro League historian. Mm-hmm. He's ecstatic, and it's, I mean, this is the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues, barely. The 1920 to 2020, they barely got this in. Um, but I just don't know what else they could do. The idea that they did it in the first place, when they didn't necessarily, they never really had to, right? Uh, and, no, they didn't. No, one's, no one, to my knowledge, was sort of calling for them to, to do this. I think that that's already and maybe i'm wrong because i mean different people obviously have different opinions within organizations and major league baseball i mean to say what we know what they're thinking from the from uh oh, rob manfred you know he's not thinking at all but you know from all from from him all the way down we don't necessarily know uh, i personally like this but when people are saying that okay you're, you're pandering to to this group i get your point when the far left saying, well, 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 thanks for nothing, Massa, you know, in that tone. I get that, too, because, yes, I mean, this was it's a, it's disgusting in a way that the Negro Leagues even had to exist. Right. Because no, it, is, it, it is disgusting that the Negro Leagues had to exist. Yeah. So uh, but here, here's my here's my question, though. Yeah. When do you think they started working on this decision? Do you think this is something they were thinking of doing uh, and they were looking for a good time? Because they did have a baseball season. They would have had plenty of opportunity to do something about the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues. I didn't see anything in there. Do you remember seeing a patch or anything in Major League Baseball? Not a thing. I don't either. So here's my question. Did they suddenly just decide to do this because the Indians are changing their name? (sighs) 
Huh. Because the Indians, that's the other thing that's going to upset people. Like, the Indians, and uh, by the way, the Blackhawks have said multiple times today that they are not changing their name. So the question is, one of my friends actually asked of the Chiefs, Braves, and Blackhawks, which is going to be the next to change their name, if any of them. I think it's easily the Chiefs, just because the Blackhawks have, like, a whole bunch of ties and there's a whole thing to it, and the Braves are sometimes the hot tomahawk chop. There's Mm -hmm. no way they're going to do it. So I think it's the Chiefs. I don't think it's going to happen with any of those three teams, but I say it would be the Chiefs. Um, But it just seems like this all came about with the Washington football team, and the Indians' name has always been one of those ones that's certainly not as derogatory as the word Redskins was. Correct, yeah. But but Chief Wahoo's existence is de- yeah it, it's it's pro- it it makes it hard for me to watch one of my favorite films Major League Major League yeah like Chief Wahoo's existence and how long Chief Wahoo existed like they only really stopped using him like within the last decade yeah no that's true and and so the fact that they're changing to something else and by the way it should be the spiders I agree. So let's, thousand percent. let's just take that out. Yeah, I know the Spiders were a National League team from, you know, a long, long time ago, and they haven't existed a long time. But there are no other Spiders, and the Cleveland Spiders is an awesome name. And they should bring it back. Yeah, I think the um, only team name I can think of is, that is the University of Richmond, I believe, are called yeah. the Spiders. So, yeah, so, yeah, 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 the Spiders, yep. Yeah. But they used to be in my league back before when my uh, college team couldn't make the NCAA tournament. Oh, okay. Uh, Richmond. Yeah, I, well, my I went to American University. I used to be in a Colonial Athletic Association back when it had like a whole bunch of really big schools, and then those schools left the same year I graduated. We also left, and we went to the Patriot League, so we could take on Lafayette and Bucknell, and not George Mason and East Carolina and Richmond. Wait, so wait, wait, uh, so wait, 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 let's back up here. So, like, how do I know that you're not far right? I mean, you just said that you were at a col- that you were a Colonial. So you're a colonizer, and you're a patriot? And I was a patriot, and you ready for this? I went to American University, and guess our colors are red, white, and blue, and our, we are the American University Eagles. If, if, you, if you ever played for the Proud Boys, I don't know if we could continue this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course, you know what? You overlooked the fact that in my younger days, I thought the Dukes of Hazard was so cool I had a Confederate flag. Not understanding full symbolism. No, but, but you didn't know any better. That's a big difference. Uh, of, so, well, I think a lot of people didn't. Right. Yeah, there's no reason to know any better. They're just good old boys not meaning no harm. So, um, anyway. <laughs> well done. But back to this. But yeah. I'm just wondering if Indians, sh- like, the Redskins have their thing disappear, and they may be the Washington football team for a significant period of time. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, because they were too dumb to get their, uh, they're too dumb to get the, when this all happened to get any of the names that might want to have like on lockdown just in case. And some fan has the Red Wolves, which is what they really want to be by all accounts. And they have to negotiate with them. So they're just going to try and do this and wait the dude out. Um, but the Indians change and then like, what, three days later they make this announcement barely at the end of 2020. Like, they had so many opportunities, even with COVID, to do something this year about this if they wanted to and have it happen during the season when they could talk about it all the time, right? But they didn't do that. And I just feel like, as from a perspective, and I understand the perspective of we were already great, we don't need you, your affirmation, Mm -hmm. But from the perspective of finally acknowledging this, it just seems to me like they were like, that if they really meant this and it wasn't rushed, it would have happened in like July. I think you're right. I I don't know how much the whole Indians thing sort of played to it. I think, actually, you know what? I think think it does. I think it did. So I think somebody got into Manfred's ear, or maybe it was Manfred himself, and he's, and Somewhere the idea sort of came up, hey, you know what, let's just be super hyper woke. And I don't know that there is really anyone at this point who was ever thinking that this isn't a move that Major League Baseball ever even had to do. Oh, 
Bell had even considered. Right. So I, this is a, a, clearly a snap decision. Statisticians were clearly not prepped for this at all. Like they, we would have heard something in this day and age. Yeah, I think you're right. I think they just got some idea from somebody, ran with it. I like this admission at the same time. What does it really mean? I know when, you know, when I was a kid, sort of like looking through like old stats of uh, baseball players in, in the pre-integration era, you know, a question I asked myself as, as a little kid, it's like, okay, yeah, Ruth's got 714 home runs. How many would he have had if, he would, if some of the great black pitchers were there? Don't know. Right. So like that's, a, that's certainly a question that goes both ways. Because I always felt that some of those number, some of those numbers in, in the majors, are delegitimized to a small degree. Yeah, but I mean that's the, the history of baseball. That's all the entire history of baseball. The numbers are in some way delegitimized all the way through. Well, exactly, like Pretty every much. era. So, I mean, and you're right. I mean, like there's not one era that you can't slap an asterisk if you really want to. I mean, you have the dead ball era in the middle there. You have World War II where a whole bunch of people are not there. Mm -hmm. You have the segregation era. You have, like, the 1920s and prior where they were playing in ballparks that didn't necessarily have fences at different points. Like, uh, I mean, the 1970s, as much as um, the Grand Proofers of Baseball don't admit it, pretty much everyone's on methamphetamines. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, the eight, eight, 80s, you have cocaine and everything else going on. And then we get the 90s, we have a steroid era. Like, the only time that might actually be clean is now. Yeah, yeah. And that, think of all the cheating. And look at all the cheating. Yeah, exactly. I was, I was just going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, Jesse the Body Ventura, uh, when, he, when he was a color commentator, he would always say, like, if, win if you can, lose if you must, but always cheat. That seems to fit baseball. Mm-hmm. And I mean, yeah. And and, and Alex <laughs> Cora got rehired by the Red Sox, and AJ Hinch got hired. Who did he get hired by? Was it uh, Milwaukee? Who hired him? I can't remember. What about Beltron? Is is uh, does, is he employed? I don't know if Beltron because he was hired by the Mets. I don't know if he's employed. We had a mini debate, very many debate. About what that meant for his Hall of Fame chances, and if Cora and, and Hinch getting rehired was going to uh, have any effect on him, because it seems very much like baseball punishes the player and not the management mm-hmm. over and over again. Um, I don't think it should have any effect on Beltron, uh, but it might. So who knows? So I guess the other question that we have here, and you and I are both stat geeks, I think. Uh, the amalgamation of, of all of this, it does change a few of the leaderboards. Uh, so one of the first things that I immediately thought is, okay, so now is officially Josh Gibson the home run king? And I, there's so many of his home runs that, that were against exhibition teams when they were barnstorming. So I, I would say, like official, officially, I was reading one article that just puts him at, what is it? I had it up. Long story short, it's not, he's not even close. Because they'll always say he's estimated to have had around 900 home runs. But then against two. Right. Well, but, I mean, that's the same argument with Sadaharu O over in Japan, because his number is like 973 or something, right? Uh, 800 and something, but it's all documented, and you know it's all against Japanese league teams. Right, but, but does that count either? Do you know what I mean? Like, like a goal scored in soccer in the Premier League, it's treated pretty much the same as a goal scored in soccer in Spain or France or Germany or Italy. But it's not as, but it's much more impressive than a goal scored in, like, Boston. Sure. You know what I mean? So is they, if, Jap, if Japan is the closest league probably in terms of quality to the United States, why you know, people will say it's the quadruple A league? You know, it's better than triple A, but not quite as good as majors. Yeah, yeah, which is, I mean, and they basically their whole argument for that is that Tuffy Rook was good in Japan. 
um, why isn't he actually the home run king? Well, I, th- I think you, you essentially answered that, which is which is why I actually uh, uh, Pete Rose said, said over and over again that about Sadaharo oh, that those those numbers there don't mean anything because it was over in Japan. Well, well, he said, well, he says that because Ichiro would have passed him if the ones in Japan, if his hit Japan count. He, need, he didn't if say that. If Ichiro hit the Japan counted, yep. Ichiro would be the hit leader in the world. Well, and depending on what metric, I mean, I, I think they're, they're still pretty valuable. But with Gibson, we don't actually know how many home runs he hit. True. On his plaque. And again, I, found, I got that article here. So it's from uh, Cleveland.com. So on Josh Gibson's Hall of Fame plaque in Cooperstown, it says he hit over 800 home runs in league and independent play. So when, you know, who do you play for? The Grays, I believe. When you're barnstorming, yeah, you're playing against some elite Negro League teams, but you're also playing against teams that may not be very good. So... I, I don't know that this changes anything. It's still Bonds. Apparently, he was asked who whether this changes anything, and Bonds said said no. Gibson's to me was always the home run king. So, mm-hmm. as far as he's concerned, nothing nothing's really changed. And I believe I believe Bonds when he says that. I actually believe Bonds when he says that too. Yeah. The so then there was another player I was looking at for our purposes who's not in the Hall of Fame. Mini Minoso. Mm. So, here, let me. So, with Mini Minoso, here's somebody who I think you and I are on the same side of the fence. I think we both think he is someone worthy of that. And I'm just trying to bring up where I found Minoso's stats in the Negro Leagues. It was only a couple years, but of course, now everything's sort of slowing down. On, on this, but it would add another 200 or so hits. Let's get somewhere. Uh, it's over 2,000. Having said that, when they're doing their elect, when the baseball voters were thinking of Minoso before, and then when he was a veteran candidate, presumably some of them can counted those votes to were considering what he did in the Negro Leagues. I would think. Not all of them, I, I don't know, but baseball's such a big numbers thing. They, know, they care so much more about numbers than every other sport. I mean, we should care more about football players on steroids. We don't because, oh my God, the sanctity of baseball. Now, Barry Bonds now broke this number. What's the number he broke? 755. What's the number that this offensive lineman broke? Uh, nothing. Yeah, well, can, can you tell me the uh, what's a single season home run record that McGuire and Sosa broke, 61, right? Right. With an asterisk. What's the single re- season rushing record? 2,100. Something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, God, I'm blanking. Okay. Yeah. What, like, the, the, the numbers just don't matter in, in hockey or basketball or, or, or football like they do in baseball. Because mm-hmm. baseball is all about the past and how the current players just aren't good as the people in the past. That's essentially baseball stick. Sorry, uh, I got it's 158 hits. So Minoso played for the New York Cubans, 46 to 48, uh, batting 314 uh, with 158 hits. So that moves. So if we add the 158, dun, 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 dun. so it puts them over 2100. Yeah, that's over 2,000 at this point. That may make a big difference. I would think so. I just don't know what uh, previous voters were looking at. Uh, The one guy, although this doesn't change really anything, who I never understood why he wasn't in yet when they inducted a whole pile of uh, Negro League players was Buck O'Neill. Yeah. Well, we talked about that before. Yeah. About About how they're like, you can pick who who we are going to elect, but we can't elect you. So, mm-hmm. exactly. So that's the only thing that I, I wonder about: is does this help? Like, 
and for our purposes, because we talk about the Hall of Fame all the time. So does this help Minoso? I would think, it, well, it can't hurt, obviously. But it, it certainly doesn't hurt him. Yeah, and it certainly sort of reflects on every, on other things that he did do. Throw in, uh, I was reading too, you throw in all his minor league hits and then Mexican league, he's got 4,000 hits. Yeah. Uh, that That's a lot of hits. <laughs> it is. Oh, oh. Yeah, I just... Oh. I got so, I got something for you because uh, I, I I think we might be done on this topic, right? Probably. Yeah. Okay, so just to close off this week, you know, t- talking about the about the Cleveland Indians here, a former Indian is now been accused of domestic abuse b- by his oh, ex-wife. Oh yeah, I forgot about that one. Yeah, I forgot about that too because in our in our pre one minute <laughs> tweet to each other DM. Would we prep for this because we're so well prepared? Omar Vizquel, mm-hmm. who is on a path to the Baseball Hall of Fame, will probably some of those votes are already in. I don't know now. There's some people will, will use the morality clause about that. Though, they'll, 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 of course, I mean one person's morality is another person's immorality, I suppose, but. Yeah. Does this hurt? Vizquel wasn't going to get in this year, but how do you see this moving forward? Now, obviously, we don't know all the details. We don't know if it's true or not. Having and, and I've seen Kentucky reports that it was out there and then retracted. Yeah, I saw that I, too. The answer, is, the answer is I don't think we know enough mm-hmm. about this, and we don't know. We don't know exactly how the the. Uh, writers feel about this, which is dumb. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know is the answer. It's going to be interesting going forward because I already think if he says he's not getting in this year, I think next year, just with the way the ballot's going to go, that he's going to go down a little bit next year. I don't think he gets in anyway, just because like we said, if nobody gets elected this year, mm-hmm. we have Schilling, Bonds, Clemens, Ahrod, and Ortiz at the top of that ballot. So Vizquel, no offense, is a distant six on that. Um, it's going to be interesting to see who they elect next year, uh, if anyone. I mean, I, I'd expect Ortiz is going to get in, uh, but I have no guarantees of that because of Ortiz's alleged fail, failure of the 2003 testing that he could neither prove nor disprove. Mm-hmm. There's essentially a rumor that was out there that he had no way of investigating because the list was supposed to be destroyed. Nobody could get, the samples were destroyed. And he and A-Rod's names were the only two pulled out there of 106 players. And uh, later, A-Rod mm-hmm. tested positive that Ortiz never did in his career. Mm-hmm. So I have no idea whether that counts against him or not. But I think this kill was probably going to suffer a little bit next year anyway right. with everybody coming on. Um. But this is certainly not going to help him. Uh, so for you personally, do you think Omar Vizquel is a Hall of Famer? And if he, if you were on the plus side, does this change it for you if you were a voter? He is super borderline to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, the defensive side of stuff, is and I'm just talking again. Not talking about him as a person. I'm not talking about these allegations. I think. No, 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 no. Just like, like, yeah. The, the, you just but, say after wh- whether that cha- would have changed your vote or not. The answer is on this ballot. Hold on, let me get the ballot in front of me for a second. I just want to see where he would be for me on this ballot. So, so I was pre- again. I was prepared for this. So. Um, Baseball reference. Uh, ballot. 2020 Hall of Fame ballot. Uh, so I'm just off the top of my head again while I'm having trouble finding this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would vote for Bonds and Clemens, certainly. For him, um, 
How many hits? He had 2,877 hits. But he also played until he was in, 45. In 24 seasons. I mean, Bonds had 2,986 in 22 seasons. But Bonds also walked so many times. Um, his OPS is 688. His slugging is 352. He batted 272 for his career. His top war, his, his seven year peak is 26.8. Like, I definitely, oh, for this, I definitely vote for Bond, Schilling, again, and I'm drawing a line between the pre steroids testing era and the post steroids testing era. Right. Um, so, as much as I love Manny Ramirez, if Manny Ramirez never did steroids or had anything, he would be in mm-hmm. for me. But I, even as a Red Sox fan, I'm keeping him out. Uh, I think that Sheffield I would probably vote for first. Uh, I'd probably vote for Andrew Jones first. Love Jones. Would I vote for Jeff Kent over him? Hmm. I mean, Kent was certainly a much worse defender. I would not vote for Billy Wagner over him, by the way. (laughs) Um, So he's no better than... So Schilling, Bonds, Clemens, Sheffield, Jones are all... That's six. So he's no better than seventh on my ballot. And I'd have to think about Roland. Oh, I'd vote for Helton over him, too. So he's no better than eighth on my ballot. So I have to think about Roland and Kent and Shane Victorino. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I think I think he's probably a yes, but I'd be agonizing it over back and forth. Would this, if this were true, would it keep him out? I'd have a lot. It'd be a lot easier for me to go on no for that. Is the answer to that question? Okay. For me, he's oh, he's a fence guy too, but more towards the no. Only because I see him as, this will sound weird, slightly overrated defensively. That's entirely possible. Some of the goal, and only because I, I did pour through as you know, one of the projects I do for the site is looking at how each award reflects into your Hall of Fame candidacy, and sometimes sometimes purely by the numbers. But when I get to the Gold Glove, there's. Oh God! I mean, I could, I could, I could write so much just about. If I were to do the top one hundred, Rafael Palmeiro won a Gold Glove at first base, in which he played sixteen games over one hundred and sixty. Right. Games. Yeah. Exactly. And that's there's so many other egregious wins of the Gold Glove. There's probably if I were to do the one hundred worst award winners in all of the big four sports, the top hundred would all be Gold Glove. <laughs> like I, I'm not, I, I guarantee it. And so now that's sort of like why they have the Fielding Bible and the Wilson Award. So Vizquel was one of those guys I was looking through, and he wouldn't have won nearly as many Wilson Awards. Mm-hmm. He wouldn't have. Now he's still number nine overall in defensive B war, but is he a bit of a compiler? You know, like we talk about compiling hits. Well. Why can't you compile war? Well, you can. So mm. we kind of did. So I was more slightly against. I mean, I do respect the fact that he did collect a lot of hits. Uh, you know, he could bunt. He did the sacrifice. He did what he could well. He was when he was on the base paths. He knew what he was doing. And then I talked myself back into it. As for whether. The allegation, as it stands now, it doesn't change me at all. But I'm very hesitant to go down that road. Because then, do we take O.J. Simpson out of the Pro Football Hall of Fame? You know, like, once we go down something, what else do we sort of look at? I'm more of the belief to keep everything on the field, on the court, I mean, and try to do what I've always sort of stress that I would do if I was in that power, keep a lot of my personal opinions in terms of character out of it, which is hard to do. Yeah. 
The good news is he took OJ out of the Hall of Fame. He had more time to look for the real killers. So um, <laughs> they're on the golf course. He's got a, he got a tip. They're on the golf. Well, you got checks. You got check the golf course. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I probably have this scale in on mine, but it's like it's a fifty-five forty-five proposition. Mm-hmm. Um, I. Uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting, though, for him going forward, particularly with this. But we've had already conflicting reports as to whether or not this is true, whether it was recanted, whether whatever. So I don't think we know enough to really make a decision one way or the other. I did look so. at her Instagram, Bianca. So she's yeah. sort of running with this. Now, or at least, again, I, 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 at least it looks that way because it's all in Spanish and I no habla. But you can sing along to Despacito, though. I'm pretty sure. Huh. Yeah, there it, it is. But I mean, she, it's I, I could I could have easily done a quick Google Translate, but I didn't really have to when she's do when she's got pictures of herself made up as a domestic ab- abuser with with, the, with with makeup showing scars on her face. I, th- I think I didn't really have to read, uh, and then it's, uh, hashtag Survivor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't really uh, need Google Translate on that one. Yeah. So. Uh, just by the way, in, ter- in terms of war, there are 25 people on this list. And again, he played 24 years. Mm-hmm. He's 16th in war. Yeah. That's, uh... he's, behind, he's behind Burley, by the way. Burley is someone else I would consider voting for. But he's behind Burley, Tim Hudson, and Tory Hunter. All of whom we're pretty sure. Well, Burley may not be one and done, but the other two will be one and done. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, behind multiple pitchers. Yeah, and and that and that's sort of the thing with with Vizquel. I mean, like, was he just like a a bet? Was he just like a, the fielding version of Julio Franco? Mm-hmm. So Vizquel, I, I I have never been a supporter for him on the, on the hall of fame. I, I won't get upset if he gets in, won't bother me, but going forward, this could, especially we, I think we're going to, this is not going to be the last time we're going to talk about Omar. That's for sure. No, agreed. All right. So with that, uh, looks like we're going to have to take a bit of a sabbatical. We're not sure when we're going to reconvene. We've got, uh, you've got your Christmas plans. My Christmas, you know what? I, I, but I'm not doing anything Christmas day because my wife's always working. Uh, you with the, with the little kids. I'm obviously. I think we know what you're going to be doing. But Pauline will be off on the 24th, so we're going to a lobster place. So we're going to go have be- go on the beach and eat lobster. Nice. Yeah. So that's actually uh, pretty good. And this is sort of what you can do when the island's done a pretty good job here of you know with all with all the issues with that. So ho- hopefully we wish. Uh, I think usually I'd sort of do the clothes off separately, but. Let's see, we can do this together. I think uh, Evan and I, we wish everyone there a hap- uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, uh, Happy Hanukkah, whatever you're celebrating. Celebrate it with your family, with your loved ones, however you can, Qu- in the safest Qu- way. Qu- Kwanzaa, Kwanzaa, Festivus, all that other stuff. Kwanzaa, Festivus, Festivus for all of us. And mm-hmm. stay safe, everybody. Absolutely. Please do. And we'll definitely be doing something again. Hey, and uh, next year... Next year for season two, you might see our faces, if you want. <laughs> I thought we were going to try and improve ratings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Well, there's that. <laughs> Are, wait, does this mean since we're at season two, we have to do character development now? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have to work on the arc, and then when things get really bad by season six, we're going to bring in Cousin Oliver. <laughs> with my with my lack of haircut, I kind of look like a grown up version of him right now. So, uh, actually, I've seen what he looks like now. No, you don't. Okay, that's good. <laughs> you definitely do not. I, I went on a YouTube re- wormhole and found his uh, YouTube that's, channel. That's a pretty deep wormhole, my friend. Uh, I well, he, yeah, it, it was. I don't even know how I got there. I think I was looked, doing a random search for the kid video cartoon song. 
And I did not realize until recently that he was on that as the geeky, as the geeky teen. And mm. then I found him actually playing it recently just on his own YouTube thing. Apparently, I, I, he very well may have written it. I don't know. But yeah, Robbie Wrist. Check that out, kids. Oh. And with that, yeah, with that. <laughs> we may see you before the new year, but if not, man, have a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and I'll talk to you then. All right. Take care of him. 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 Take care of him.